I'm Leslie Gibson. I'm a writer looking to find a vibrant, creative, diverse community to call home. Home is that basic need for shelter, safety and support, and it's what we all have in common, isn't it? But a sense of belonging may always remain elusive. In these first six podcasts, I'll be talking to Val McDermott, the award-winning crime writer, Paul Kindy Band, the Tin Pigeons, and Keely Mills, the Chubby Mermaid, as well as poets, wandering minstrels, artists and sculptors from across the UK who will be deciding whether they're creative because of or despite their hometown. Where will I be tempted to lay down my hat, I wonder? Make me believe in all that I don't know. So, I'm still looking for a place to call home, and as promised, this week the spotlight's on Wakefield in West Yorkshire. It's a complete cultural contrast to Stamford. Even though it's barely two hours away, it's definitely bigger, more northern, the weather, accent, character and countryside are all very different. I wanted to come here for two reasons. First of all, I love Yorkshire. And second of all, the Yorkshire Sculpture Park's there. And one particular exhibition changed my entire outlook on life about eight years ago, but that was a touring exhibition. The Sculpture Park has many touring exhibitions as well as permanent outdoor sculptures. So the Hepworth Art Gallery is also in Wakefield. It's the birthplace of that celebrated sculptor, Barbara Hepworth. It's a fabulous place. The windows are huge and show you absolutely the best of Wakefield. The water, the boats, the scenery, the architecture. And it's all the more surprising because it's virtually on a roundabout. And that's before you even mention the sculptures. What a fabulous place. So Wakefield, despite being quite industrial, is in fact somewhere stuffed with art and culture. And luckily, someone suggested to me that the man to talk to was Tony Wade, the community artist. He's originally from Goole, but he spent most of his working life in Wakefield, in and around it in any case. I began by asking him about his project Boundary No Boundary, which I had recently visited at the cathedral and which seemed to be a visual representation of my search for belonging. So, Tony, it's over to you. In a nutshell, I wanted to record the boundary line, the Wakefield Metropolitan District boundary line, because I'd been working in Wakefield since I left Bretton Hall as a student, and that would be 30-odd years ago. I'd been working at the Sculpture Park and, and looking at maps, and there was a map on the wall in their office, and they had this little dotted line going through their, their lake, which I kind of noticed and I didn't really think any more about it. And when I was looking at the Wakefield District, when I, I was thinking of trying to do something which summed up the district and what people felt about it and what I felt about it. Once you start looking at community, it's very easy to say it's all one thing. Mm. Uh, Wakefield is a city. It's not. It's made up of several housing estates and boroughs. And in those boroughs, there's there's streets that have their own identity. So I've, I've kind of kicked myself a bit, thinking I was arrogant enough to say, of course I've worked in Wakefield, when actually there's, there's incredibly important communities within it and I haven't been there. Mm. So I kind of wanted to look at something where I, I could work with as many that I hadn't worked with before. And I thought about this boundary line. I remember the boundary line I saw on the Sculpture Park's map. And, and so I, I got an Ordnance Survey map and I got in the car and I drove as far east as I could and looked at the map. And I found this little boundary line and it went across a bridge over the M62, which is quite a nice place because then I could look, because I'm from Goole. And I was born in a village called Rockcliffe near Goul. It's next to Drax Power Station. And on this bridge, I could see Drax Power Station in the distance. So I could see home or where I was born mm. from this furthest east point of the Wakefield District. So I was making a connection between where I was at college and where I've lived and worked professionally and where I still think as home. Mm. Even though at that point, when I, started, when I was sat on that bridge, I was thinking I've spent more of my life in Wakefield than I have over towards Goul, and so I could see in that one landscape the story of my life, the journey so far, where I was born and where I've worked professionally. So I was stood on this bridge, and on this little grey dotted line, because the boundary line on the Ordnance Survey map is a little grey dotted line. Mm-hmm. So I started looking at this dotted line that I was stood on, and obviously it doesn't exist, it's not on the floor. And so I was intrigued by it, because this dotted line has created this district, 
And with a bit of research, it was in 1974 that somebody somewhere or a group of people decided to create Wakefield Metropolitan District and drew this dotted line on a map somewhere. So before then, Wakefield was part of West Yorkshire and there was other boroughs and other things. But someone created this artificial community bound together by this dotted line. Mm. It kind of like hems them in. So I thought, I'm going to walk this line as closely as I can, and I wanted to interview people that live on either side of it, because it does go through communities. So there's a place in Osset where it it goes between two houses, for example. Uh, So one house lives in Wakefield and one house lives in Kirklees. (laughs) So I thought, right, I'm going to walk this, and I'm going to interview people and and ask them what they feel about this boundary line. Do they they recognise it? Do they own it? Uh, Do they just disregard it? And has it any physical reality on the ground? Because it's a dotted line. I tweeted the uh, Ordnance Survey and did say, you know, if this grey dotted line was a feature on the landscape, how big would it be? They tweeted back, we've got no idea, it doesn't exist. So this thing that doesn't exist causes division (laughs) and all kinds of um, conversations with people. I did actually measure it out on a piece of grass. It it, it would be a 50 long piece of... um, landscape so a 50, 50, 50, 50 meter long 50 piece meters. so i actually for one, cre- dot. for one dot so i created it in hazard tape in thorns park in wait i photographed <laughs> it and i sent it back to the ordinance survey went it'll look this big <laughs> i thought because i wanted to document it and i didn't know how mm. and that's when i come with the idea that i wanted to paint it yeah. and so I, I measured the boundary and it was 60 miles it's quite a nice round number and every three miles i would sit and i'd paint what i could see from horizon to horizon, looking outwards. Mm-hmm. And I think it was very keen that it was an outward-looking project rather than me looking inwards to the district. Yeah. I wanted to look out and show what the view was like. And so then the idea was once I'd walked the entire boundary line, I would have these paintings. So I thought I'd sit and paint on three panels, so one panel for each mile. Yeah. So I'd have 60 paintings, which would form a complete view of the Wakefield district boundary looking out. That's the plan, and obviously it's the daft plan because Wakefield is not on a hill and the rest of the world isn't flat, so <laughs> this was never going to work. And, and the boundary isn't a complete circle. It follows, it follows streams, it follows rivers, it goes along the side of the A1, the M62, so it was an idea that was never, ever going to work, but it decided not to let that stop me from doing it. So the paintings don't form a complete view. They, never, they do crisscross, and if you've seen on the map, I try to make sure that the sight lines do cross yes but it's more about the experience of being in the landscape and just painting what's there regardless of what I see so I wasn't trying to paint something beautiful you know it could be a housing estate it could be a hill but it was what was there and it turned out that everything that was there was incredibly beautiful it was it was I've seen it it was Mm. thank you much (laughs) and I have when I stood in the middle because you arranged them in a a circle didn't you that's right yes and then they're kind of at eye level aren't they so if you stand in the middle and look round it's a very emotional experience and I actually met someone coming out who felt very emotional about it and he grabbed my arm I was a stranger to him and told me I had to go and see this wonderful exhibition because he'd was from this area, had lived here his whole life, and he really didn't know where he was from until he'd seen it. I know as I got older, it became the need to belong somewhere, yes. I think, became more important, whereas when I was younger, I, just, I would happily go anywhere. But maybe as you get older, you, kind of, you, you want to kind of establish your identity, and where you're from becomes part of that identity. And certainly for me, because cause it's, it's the work that I do, working in community arts, you're working in communities, and, yeah. and it's very much about responding to how they feel about their environments. But having lived in Wakefield alongside the people I work with, I think we have that shared sense of identity and a shared sense of belonging. Yes. I've never been that curious to live somewhere else. I've never Mm -hmm. had that kind of sense of people saying they have an itchy feet and they want to travel. I do for work, and so there's, there's projects all over the place, but I've never felt the need to explore anywhere else because I think there's enough places around here for me to explore for the rest of my life and find interest and I think because I've maybe because I've been here for so many years I find interest in those places that I wouldn't normally find interest in so you know I see a a mound of earth which I now spot has got 30 year old trees on I know that in this district that was once a mine and so I can go to that place and and discover more about it so rather than just being a a hill on the landscape that I ignore it becomes a place that I actually want to go and explore there's there's the M62 corridor and there's a parallel two parallel lines one's the M62 motorway and one is the canal they both go towards Goole and where I'm from Mm. I've kind of 
worked on with communities alongside the canals for a number of years because for me it's interesting because it connects the two sides of the district, it flows through it and it's part of natural waterway, it's part of the, the River Calder, the River Eyre and then there's kind of man-made parts of it so to cut out bends and cut out weirs so it's this strange hybrid between a, a natural object and a very rigid piece of Victorian engineering, even older. Yeah. Um, so some parts of the canals are like 300 years old. Uh, yeah. They're very historically important. And then this district has kind of been shaped by the canals. And I'm, I'm always fascinated that this landscape that we, we see is, is kind of a veneer that we put on top of it. So I use maps a lot as a way of getting people to explore their environment. Yes, I liked it when you mentioned the maps and said you'll have seen from there because I look at a map and it means absolutely nothing, oh, nothing. I, I love it because it, it, it's, it's a mystery. Again, it's, it's an abstract thing. We've created this language mm. to describe our landscape. Yeah. So we've created these red lines, we've given them a colour, we've given these dots and dashes that means a physical boundary. Yeah. It is, it's an abstract way of describing the landscape so that we can interpret it. All the rivers, basically, in Yorkshire eventually end up coming past Goul. And so mm. I was, so, so Rockcliffe's a little village on the River Eyre, and then four miles away is Goul, where I went to grammar school. But all the rivers in Yorkshire come out there. They join the Ouse, becomes the Humber, and flows past into the North Sea. So just about everything, all the waterways, River Don goes there as well. Trent is just a bit further down the river from Goul, but they all seem to end up there. So I'm always fascinated by the fact that all these waterways and all these journeys, well, Goul is this kind of out of the way place. You mentioned from Goul and people kind of have a wry smile. It's, they find it almost like a, it's an amusing place. Um, I see the name and wonder about wonder. it, but that's as far as it goes. Mm. Oh, that's a strange name. So I've always been yeah. really proud because all, the, all these waterways go there. Okay. and flow past it and it's so uh, so I've loved, kind of loved it. I felt felt I said loved it yes I loved it for that reason and the fact that I feel so I can always kind of go home by just following this canal should I feel the urge so next you hear from Rachel she's Rachel Hall when she's writing prose or pro fiction and she's Rachel Lawrence when she writes poetry she is if you like a community writer So for many years, she lived away from her hometown of Huddersfield, which is just a few West Yorkshire miles away from Wakefield. When she returned home a decade ago, she said it felt like a piece of herself had clicked into place. And I wondered what it was about the industrial landscape that satisfied and stimulated her creativity. And I was amazed after speaking to her to see how similar her inspirations were to Tony's. So these two people have really immersed themselves into their communities. And as a result, they feel a real sense of belonging. And I'm beginning to think it might be where I'm going wrong. I started teaching this creative writing course at Dewsbury for Adults. It was, you know, just one evening a week for about eight weeks. And I'm always quite keen on taking participants out to write on location. So I was kind of looking around Dewsbury and trying to find somewhere that I thought would be a good location to do some writing in. And uh, came across the train station at Dewsbury, which is... It's really beautiful. It's just a little Victorian station, but it's beautifully uh, conserved and everything, and it's got some really interesting features in architecture and very atmospheric, and I thought, well, this would be a great place for me to bring the students. So one night we came down to Dewsbury Station and uh, wrote various poems, applying some of the techniques that I taught during the course... And then the thought occurred to me, well, wouldn't it be great to have an exhibition in the station? And then we had a a sort of launch for the exhibition and there's quite a lot of publicity around that. We ended up doing an exhibition at Staley Bridge Station, which is also quite well known because it's, again, a, a beautiful Victorian station. And during the course of the exhibition at Dewsbury, I met up with some people from an arts organisation called Creative Scene and I kept in touch with them and and eventually they contacted me and said they wanted me to do some other projects so there's a couple of things that I did with them one was the Textile Towns projects which was looking at the way that textiles had 
influenced Dewsbury in that area of West Yorkshire. And looking how it had changed over the years, obviously its boom days were through the Victorian era, and but then as, as it entered the 60s and all the cheaper fabrics from other countries came onto the market, it really affected the mills and there was the demise of the of the textile trade. Then I was going to look at the change of usage of the canal over the years. And, you know, I really am always looking out because I think if you can do a creative writing project and then produce an exhibition, it generates uh, interest amongst the community of their local area in a way that maybe their interest hasn't been piqued in that way before the canals are, they're like these arteries mm. now that they've all been there's been a lot of conservation a lot of clearing of canal towpaths and it's possible to walk an awful mm. long way on the canals they've become again the arteries that connect these different areas there's somehow these almost like membranes like thin places where they're separate from the rest of life. They're very quiet. You can be very alone with your thoughts, and I think it attracts people for that reason. You're looking at the industrial past of this place and the, the canals and the geography and the geology, which actually Tony's doing as well. Mm. I, I don't think I realised I would learn as much about landscape and geography from artists. I'm mm. really... That's something that's really... It's touched me, actually. It's really amazing to me. It's helping root people in a sense of place. And that once... When I first stayed with you, Rachel, I really I really noticed the chimney scape in Huddersfield, and I thought that was quite beautiful, actually, mm-hmm. to be high up, because I currently live in a very flat place, mm-hmm. and to have a complete landscape of chimneys, which to me is just like Mary Poppins, mm-hmm. and it's the stuff of stories. And um, I remember you once saying to me that creativity often came out of adversity so I was wondering if you could just explain that a little bit yeah I mean I think being in adverse situations does actually cause you to really explore what makes you you as a human being and how how you fit together so you you end up really analyzing a lot because you're constantly being challenged you know whether that's financially or relationship wise emotionally you know you know even if you're in a a place that seems very devoid of beauty you're challenged to find the beauty to find the aesthetic Mm. in what might be deemed shabby or unattractive areas I mean you know Huddersfield it it is actually very beautiful because its heyday was in the textile era and so it had more millionaires in London at one time and if you look at the architecture, you can see that. But the town planning uh, hasn't been the best and maybe the priorities haven't been quite right. So you've got areas that you think, you know, did anybody actually plan this? Because it looks dreadful. And and yet still within that, you can find something beautiful. So that was Rachel. So you can see how similar her inspirations were to Tawny's. Wakefield itself is a city of sanctuary and it opens its own doors to those who are fleeing their own country. There are several cities of sanctuary in the UK and Wakefield is one of them. But the Art House also provides space and opportunities for artists of sanctuaries and you're about to meet two of them. Rania is up first. She is from Iraq and her voice really reminds me of melting chocolate. She's in her early 20s and she arrived in the UK with a family at 16, actually from the United Arab Emirates where her father had had a job. And when that came to an end, it wasn't safe for them to return to Iraq. So Rania's work is diverse. She draws, she paints, she sews. And to me, her work has that wonderfully complicated geometric repetition you'd find in Moorish architecture. Here she is telling you about the home she found in Wakefield. 
We left our home, friends, everything there. It wasn't safe to go back, was it? Uh, uh, not to United Arab Emirates. No. Uh, because if they cancelled his visa, you mm. have to go back to Iraq, where we, I am originally from. Okay. And it wasn't safe, and okay. it's still not safe as no. well. So we just like decided to stay in here, mm-hmm. and uh, it was a bit difficult mm-hmm. to get used to it now. We get used around the area and people. Mm-hmm. I went to Wakefield College. I stayed in Wakefield College for eight years, mm-hmm. um, studied different courses, mm-hmm. ended up with a triple distinction in fashion and textile. Wow. And then uh, I've done uh, like teaching assisting down there mm-hmm. as well, uh, same department, art department. That was my home as well. It mm-hmm. was like my family there as well. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. I cannot describe. Like they are the ones who make me feel welcome in here, and uh, they are the one who make me like not feel like I'm strange. Mm. I do have friends now. Mm. Lots of friends around in Wakefield. The neighbors. We've been living like in different sorts of houses, different mm. areas in Wakefield. So like all the neighbors, like they are lovely. So <laughs> I'm still a friend with them. Yeah, I I, I don't feel myself like leaving Wakefield yeah. I do love nature yeah. I do love nature so I, I would love like to keep exploring mm. especially I like to keep explore and uh, I like to find out new things as well I like to see new places mm-hmm. so yeah I love to see the, the countryside more it was an end of November, mm-hmm. when uh, my mom, she went to Wakefield Shopping Center. Mm-hmm. She was like, want to find a solution for me and my sister because our application for student loan, it's been refused mm-hmm. and we start universities uh, after uh, deferring our places many times. Mm-hmm. She was like trying to find a solution, like somewhere like scholarship or anything to help us with. Mm-hmm. She talked about me and a man there, he told her like, if I go to speak to... Uh, Sydney in here in the art house and have uh, to book an appointment with her as well. I've done that Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was so exciting for the first time. (laughs) (laughs) It was like once she say yeah next Friday and she give me the time and I say oh my god I tell my mom I was like in the we was going to the to buy some new things for the new house and like in front of people I start to jump she said what's up I said mom she said she wants to see me next Friday Aww. so it was a bit exciting yeah. and then in the end she say welcome home and then oh. she's like wow it was like oh I've got goosebumps yeah. oh it how like, lovely yeah it was um, a great thing actually and I feel like I'm at home with my family yeah. uh, everybody are wonderful in here they are amazing, to be honest. Mm. My parents, they do support us. Mm. We are five, so they do support five of us. <laughs> wow. uh, there's a dancer, the youngest, she's mm-hmm. a dancer. And there's uh, one, she's, she loves the beauty things. Mm. And um, one, she's, uh, she wants to be a doctor, she's mm. doing medicine. And I'm the artist. Mm-hmm. And there's one between us, the boy, he's like IT person. Oh. So they are like, just support us. All what we have, like all these skills, it won't be supported in that, like back in our Arabic countries. Mm. It, it will be different. It's not like in here. People like, they like the creatives. They like, they don't care like whatever you want to be. It's your future. So you are looking after your future. Back there, it will like it will be a bit of issue, especially like for um, the girls. They mm. want like thinking to be like about the beauty, or they think about like especially the youngest if she want to be a dancer or an actress. So that will be an issue back there. But in here, it's it's up to them. It's like mm. totally up to them, and just like living how, whatever we want to do, we just do it. So, I told you that voice was lovely. Here's more now. He's slightly older and he's from Iran. He was born with the use of only one arm, but it has never held him back. Far from it. He's not only an incredibly successful Paralympian, but his work has been already exhibited in the Tate Modern, won numerous competitions, and the British Museum has asked him to run a workshop in the winter. He is so looking forward to finally being able to call himself 
uh, British Iranian artist, and he's really keen to let people know that he makes his own way in the world. So due to his dedication, his English isn't always clear because he spends most of his time alone in the studio or training. But he's a joyous, sociable, engaging man with an extraordinary talent. It's traditionally Persian in its origin and on a vast scale with a modern twist. You can hop over to the website if you want to see some photos. Okay, I'm back in the art house with Mo and he's going to introduce himself to you in a moment. But can I just say that I'm in his studio and it's absolutely amazing. And you can see photos of that on the website. It's very eclectic. And he's just shown me <laughs> lots and lots and lots of Paralympic medals, gold medals. Okay. So he's obviously a polymath. I'm Mo. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm living in work for two years. Mm-hmm. But I'm artist and athletic. Mm. I have a forward medal. But actually, my studio here in the Wakefield, in the art house. Yeah, I'm usually using in Iranian calligraphy mm-hmm. and uh, with an Iranian pen. Right. Uh, but yes, I love it in art and I love it in my studio, actually. <laughs> well, it is fantastic here. Yeah. There's a record player and bananas and a bicycle. <laughs> and, uh, <everything>. work. <laughs> and work. Today take an email about a workshop mm-hmm. and uh, for November right. the British Museum I'm so happy well yes because uh, one years ago uh, I was in London for exhibition in Tate Modern Were you? yes wow. <laughs> but this year in a British Museum right I think it's very good I'm after moving here I think it's really better for me because really, art in UK is really international. I think it's really better for me. Yeah. And how have you settled in Wakefield? Why did you choose Wakefield? Wakefield. Why not London yeah. or Edinburgh? Why? Because uh, any asylum, any person after problem mm-hmm. in any country moving here in home office mm-hmm. told me you are coming Can't Wakefield. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, I bought in Wakefield have a, I don't know, in a house for mm-hmm. asylum in a hostel yes I see. What yes mm-hmm. uh, two months yeah. i'm living in hostel yeah after two months uh, home office told me okay waiting big feet i think i'm lucky <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes yeah. because in the art house here <laughs> <laughs> well i think yes i think you're lucky but i think that the art house is yeah. also lucky because you're here oh, and thanks. look what you're doing thank you thanks because yes but uh, uh i think it's here is good for me because for not just for refugee and asylum, mm-hmm. for disability artists, yeah. uh-huh. but for me, actually, I'm disabled. Yeah. September, I move in London. <gasps> wow. Yes, but I think I'm very missing in the art house. Will you? <laughs> yes, yeah. because two years I live in here, I, yeah. I'm every time thinking, magazine, for example, interview with me, I'm told, in, I think it's art house, not just my studio, yeah. my home. Yeah. Because I have a now is two years have a family here, you know. Yeah. Really important for any artist have a supporter. Art yeah. house, amazing. Mm-hmm. Well, they've got trust in you, haven't they, and faith in you, and they're obviously proud of you because yeah. they wanted they wanted me to speak to you, so they're proud of you. So, and how about Wakefield, the town? I love it, Wakefield, yeah. because it's small, mm-hmm. but it's very nice. Yes. I think it's very, very kindly, yeah. very kindly city, you know, is mm. uh, uh, anyone know, ask me where you're from, why you are living, it's, I think it's really nice, Yes. I think it's really important for me and my any friend, mm-hmm. yeah. Actually, that's a, a recurring theme, that's something that's coming through loud and clear, that Wakefield is a friendly city. Yeah. You've told us a few times that you have a disability, what is your disability? Uh, my hand. I'm uh, using collage for my work, but I'm using my hand. My, my sorry, my leg. Right. One two, leg yeah. and one hand. Wow. I told. I think I'm. <laughs> I have a two hands <laughs> because my leg is no, it's my hand. 
Phew, so that's us at the end of our trip. I suspect that Moore's home will be wherever his talent takes him in the future, but I think as long as he's got it with him, he's never going to be lonely. I did partake of Wakefield nightlife before I went and had a great time all round. I absolutely loved it. I loved the people. I loved the opportunities. I loved the black lager. I loved the creativity and I loved the welcome. And I think everyone I met there was definitely home. What I did feel was that I missed the beauty of the Stamford streets and the relative safety of being somewhere small where everyone knows you. Honestly, Wakefield, it's been a blast and I'm really going to miss you. Next week, it's back to Stamford and how to feel at home when you're struggling with your own company. The Way Home Project is written and presented by me, Leslie Gibson. The editor was Claire Crofton. Music and project artwork by the Tin Pigeons. Get off now and plug to the pod website for more insights, comments and transcripts, along with photos and bits of other fluff and stuff. Remember to describe and subscribe and invite your friends along so you can talk about me afterwards. More next week. <laughs>